Today's interview, I go all the way down under in Australia. This is my buddy Lee Martinuzzi. This guy has been around for a while. Uh, he actually had a podcast that I was on years ago. I want to say six years ago, five years ago, something like that. And that's kind of how we met. And uh, guy's just incredibly interesting. But what I wanted to dig into with this interview was this lawsuit that's happening here in the U.S. about the buyer agent commission. And so down in Australia, of course, they've been operating like that for years where, you know, the listing agent doesn't pay the buyer agent commission. And most of the time, the buyers come directly to the listing agent. So I wanted to have a conversation with him on air here for you guys to listen to how real estate agents operate in Australia. And so if these lawsuits, if these lawsuits actually go through, um, then this is what we could be looking at, the way that agents operate in Australia. And so that's why I wanted to do this. So it's it's very interesting. Um, we get into a little bit of his story and then he breaks down exactly how uh, the industry operates down there. And, um, you know, it, I, I just really wanted to understand it, even for myself, if in fact this these lawsuits go through, it's going to be a huge, huge change in the industry, but it's going to be no different from how agents all over the world already operate. And I could just go on and further say, you know, if you're worried about these lawsuits, it's something that you shouldn't be worried about. It's nothing that you can control. What you have to do is you have to kind of take yourself out of that situation and put yourself into, hey, I'm going to do my job. What is my job? My job is to help as many people buy and sell real estate as humanly possible. If something happens in industry and creates a, a real massive shift in the way that we operate as an industry here in, in real estate, as real estate agents in the U.S., then we just have to pivot. We have to pivot to whatever the new landscape is going to be and get out there and continue doing what we're supposed to do. And this really kind of digs down into the core of Zero Diamond my free coaching program for real estate agents and what we do at Zero to Diamond, which is help agents be more owner-based. You know, a lot of agents out there are buyer heavy, you know, and if something like this goes through, it's going to really change a lot of things. It's going to change a lot of things on the listing side as well, I believe. Um, so we'll, we'll see how it all shakes out. I'm interested to see and following the lawsuits, but I wanted to bring Leon to, ex uh, to explain how real estate operates in Australia so that you kind of understand what we could be looking at. All right. So enjoy the uh, interview. Comment below. Let me know what you think. Subscribe. All that good stuff. And here we go. So then the goal there is for her to transition as she learns more into being a single agent and kind of going out on her own is that the plan like in my mind like this is a major crash but transactions transactions are down to 2008 levels 2008 was our worst year through that massive crash you know and everything uh, there was tons of foreclosures a lot of inventory right now there's basically historic low inventory but what i'm getting at is that we're experiencing a very depressed market when it comes to transactions here. Are you guys experiencing the same thing? So if that interest rate starts to drop and this demand there, that's just gonna cause, you know, a new peak in prices. But I just have this feeling that they're gonna do everything they can do to simulate the economy. And 98%, according to a survey of these millennials, want to become homeowners. Um, and so we have record amount of 33 year olds, tons of owners who wanna upgrade their home that are just kind of sitting there brewing and just building and building and building right now. Hey, what's up everybody? Ricky Carruth here and welcome to the show. I've got a really good friend that I've known for a really long time down in Australia, my buddy Lee. How you doing, bro? I'm great. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, man. So it's 4.30 for me. It's 7.30 in the morning for you, right? Yeah. I mean, you future. 4.30 after, 4.30 in the afternoon, 7.30 in the morning. So <laughs> it's always crazy. Friday morning. Yeah. You guys are always uh, working while we're sleeping over here. I see that board behind you, man. You selling a bunch of property? Give us you, give us you on the rack. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to bring you on because um, we have this lawsuit happening here in the U.S. about buyer agent commissions. Everybody's worried about it and stuff. And actually, down there in Australia, you guys, um, you guys have it. You guys have operated without basically buyer agents for a long time. Although it's kind of it's kind of a negotiable deal 
right? Okay. I kind of want to, I kind of want to dig into that a little bit. But before we do, people that haven't, you know, seen you on my channel or whatever, how long have you been in real estate? Give us a little bit of background. Yeah, I was just looking at that the other day. Actually, someone asked the question. I couldn't really figure it out. But I was, I was three years in the industry. Uh, went for two years um, overseas with the family, so out of real estate. Another year after that, came back in, and I've been back in for about four and a half years now. So a total of about eight years. Okay. Now, All right. Cool. There's other residential properties here, down under Australia. Um, so if you know Australia well, I'm in a state called Queensland, which is one of the northern eastern coast states. And I uh, started down the Gold Coast, which is a beautiful area, and then uh, transitioned to the Sunshine Coast, which is even more gorgeous. Um, so sell properties up here in a lovely little hinterland town um, and just loving it, just loving it. Yeah, yeah. I know the that one time you, you showed me uh, kangaroos there outside your window. That, kinda, that was kind of wild. Yeah, that was um, one of my colleagues, actually. I think she had some kangaroos in the background. <laughs> you know, we help around them sometimes. Cool, man. Well, yeah, you and you've been part of my group here at EXP for two years? Yeah, about two and a half now. Two and a half. You hit Icon both years? Icon both years, hoping for a third year this year. Nice, bro. Nice. So down in Australia, let's kind of start with this, and then we'll get into the, the actual, you know, the lawsuit thing here and like how you guys actually operate. But down there in terms of like lead gen, um, making phone calls, door knocking, things like that. Like what kind of things do you guys do? What's, what's the common activities down there for you guys to go meet property owners? Are you calling them or you're door knocking or you're sending mailers? Like how, how do things work there in terms of lead gen to go out and get listings? Yeah, look much, much the same as probably how it works with you guys. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I, I really appreciate your model of, of prospecting, being authentic, just being yourself, going out there, helping people build relationships. Um, and I think that's what's a big difference from a lot of players in the industry. They're going out there with these egos and trying to be too salesy. Um, whereas your model of prospecting is just about, you know, going out there, trying to help people, trying to help people with their plans moving forward. So that's essentially what we do here. Um, you know, cold calling, circle prospecting, as you call it. Um, calling warm leads, things like that. Those activities are big on my list. Now, not everyone likes doing that. Um, I guess there's the fear of of making those calls, uh, but that's a big part of it. There is door locking. Some people just love getting out, walking the streets, saying good day to people in their front yards, door locking on a few houses, and connecting face to face like that. So that's a big part of some people's lead gen strategy. Not a big part of mine anymore. It was at the start, but as I got busy, it was just a time consuming thing. So I just focus on the calls, uh, flyer drops, letterbox drops. Um, the big part of my business and a big part of a lot of people's business. So just, you know, brand awareness, putting your name out there in the community. Um, another big part of my business is community. I've got a very nice community, so it's not a big city. We actually have a sense of community here. So I get involved in the community and do movie nights and, you know, clean up Australia days and just throw events around and, and get out there in the community because people love coming together. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a big part of, I guess not lead gen, but it is ultimately what it boils down to. Um, and then finally, social media, like a lot of people in that digital space now, mm. um, and I am too, um, not as significantly as others, but that's a big part of some people's business where they just, they just mail down on social media and they get mm. leads through that process as well. Do you, uh, do you get leads and stuff? Do you, do you do get any business from social media? Look, I think it's, um, a lot of brand awareness for me. Um, mm. my strategy has been for the last couple of years, I am trying something at the moment with a particular company um, to generate leads. Um, so I'm, I'm just trialing that at the moment, see how that works. It's only early days. Um, and so far the results aren't, aren't huge or significant to, to know. Um, but certainly um, using social media for, you know, I guess you're letting people know who you are, building that trust before you have to walk in the door. Um, that's huge. And yeah, a lot of videos. I'm doing a lot more videos now as well. Yeah, I've seen your content. What? How many deals have you done this year? No, about 20, 20 or so. Oh, I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm targeting forty. That's what I did last year. And you're, um, and you're a single agent, or you have a team, or how? What's the structure of the business? I've got a, I've got a trainee who works with me. So she's sort of the trainee real estate agent that's slash assistant, uh, and that's it. Just the two of us. And that's that's all you need. Like you know. 
It's uh, so do you have you have an assistant though on top of that, or it's just you two? Just us two. Yes, yeah, so she's just, so you so you do all your admin and stuff like that. She does most of that. Well, she's trying. oh she does it. She does it. Yeah. And yeah. so then the goal there is for her to transition as she learns more into being a single agent and kind of going out on her own. Is that the plan? Either that she'll go into to real estate mode, or she might stay as my sales assistant, just depending on where she's fitting in that. And yeah, right. He's not not as confident to go out there on her own full time. I don't think so. She'll probably mm -hmm. just be my assistant for a bit longer. Right. And so the differences in the U.S. and Australia, like in terms of like licensing. So when you guys get licensed, you have to go through like this trial period for a year, right? Before you can actually go out and be an agent or what's the process there? Well, it's, it's, it's different in every state, um, Ricky. So in New South Wales and, and uh, Melbourne, it's a bit more um, regimented like that. We have to train for a year before you go out. Up in Queensland, it's a bit more relaxed. You just have to go out there and do your license course. Um, whether that's your, your partial license or your full sales license. Um, so a lot of people are doing these days because a lot of people are going out there and, and joining these models like EXP. So you have to be a fully licensed agent with a company license as well. Mm. Uh, in Queensland, I can't speak for New South Wales and Victoria as such, but in Queensland, you do your course. Um, and as soon as you get that license, you can go straight out there and sell it. Okay. So it just depends on the state, state by state. And then like here in the US, we are we're literally experiencing, a, um, like in my mind, like this is a major crash. Okay. Prices aren't down, right? Prices are prices have held firm. Um, we had a slight correction, but it's bounced back to, to about even, um, like we're basically at all time highs right now, but as far as prices go, but transactions, transactions are down to 2008 levels. 2008 was our worst year through that massive crash, you know, and everything. Um, and you know, what we'll, as a country, we're going to hit, we're on track somewhere in the 4.2 million range, number of transactions, something like that. Last year was 5 million. The year before was 6 million. Yeah, wow. 6 million was a big year. That was the big year. And then we had 5 million, 5 million is like a really good year. And this year we're around 4.2 and back in 2008, it was 4.1 million. So we're literally right there on the, you know, right, right where we were uh, during the worst year that we yeah. had, you know, back in the crash in terms of number of transactions. So it's a depressed market when it comes to transactions, but prices have held firm, you know, back in 2008, prices went down like, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50%, yeah. depending on where you were. And uh, there was tons of foreclosures, a lot of inventory. Right now there's basically historic low inventory. Yeah. Uh, we have massive demand. We have so much pent up demand. Um, we have historic amounts of pent up demand. I could get into all that, but I don't want to bore you with all that nerdy real estate stuff. But <laughs> nerdy real estate stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but what I'm getting at is that we're experiencing a very depressed market when it comes to transactions here. Are you guys experiencing the same thing? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I I look at the market very um, optimistically. Um, that's just my nature. But it is. Um, Transactions are definitely down. Um, mm -hmm. I the exact numbers here, but I did look at them a few weeks ago for my particular market here on the Sunshine Coast, but across Australia, um, numbers mm -hmm. are significant. I know in the office here, my numbers of transactions are down uh, compared to this time last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and values are still holding. Values yeah. are still holding. haven't really fallen back that much. And I think a lot of people ask me and say, did the values fall down? I said, well, not really. It's just that we didn't have that, that competition that we had in 2021, 2022 which is yeah. really seeing in, in inflating prices. Mm -hmm. The price I'm back to that level where there's there's no competition. And yeah. today, we're still finding like nice presented properties, three-week campaigns, multiple offers being achieved and selling, um, you know, selling very quickly. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. from here. Um, and we're, we're experiencing a shortage in all-time historic lows. So, okay. You know? Mm -hmm. Um. And I see this pent up demand building and I, I, everyone's talking about this, this, um, mortgage rate cliff. So a lot of people coming off their fixed rates here in Australia. And they're saying that'll force a lot of people come on to sale and, and some, some stress sales happening, mm -hmm. bring prices down again. I don't see that happening right now that all indications show that there's so much demand out there. Mm -hmm. So like properties that I think that the, um, the prices may rise even further from here for at least a couple of years before we see a, a fairly significant crash. So like, 
the the debt that's becoming mature that has lower rates going into this higher rate environment, I guess. Mm. Um, you're saying like people are saying that these are going to be distressed properties, but you're saying there's enough demand where okay, if something's distressed, okay, whatever, I'll just sell it and make a hundred thousand or whatever the case yeah. may be. Yeah. Anyone bought in that in that 2021, 2022 period mm. is coming off that fixed rate and then their their mortgage repayments are doubling or tripling. You know, there's yeah. gonna be a, a, a few property owners that will have to do that. And we're already seeing investors doing that where they're seeing the, the return shrink, so they're going, let's get rid of it. Yeah. If you in that period and try to sell now, you're probably not gonna make make your money back, you know? So you but, guys in Australia, just just to clarify, um, you guys don't have 30 year fixed mortgages, right? Yeah. Yep. You do? In five, 30 years. Yep. Okay. And then some so of the, the variable and fixed rate. So the, the rates changes. So you can have a variable rate line or a fixed rate line. Pretty much like to do that. Oh, well, well, that's what I mean. 30 year fixed. Like you don't have a, you guys don't have a 30 year fixed mortgage, right? No. no. Yeah. See, see, we have 30 year fixed mortgage. They actually open it up to 40 year. Um, yeah, I haven't like heard anybody using those forty years. Like they just announced that like this year or whatever. But thirty year fix has been around a long time here in the U.S. Like that's the go to. That's the conventional loan. That's yeah. That's the loan that you know the government will insure. You know Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They they'll buy those on the second market, and it allows you know banks and mortgage companies and brokerages to go out there and you know service. I mean sell all these loans. And then sell them to on the second market and kind of re up to go do more loans, and the debt is fixed for thirty years. So that's what's so crazy about here is that the people that bought well, see our rate, our mortgage rates got down to like under three percent. Yeah, and so right, so everybody either went and bought a house or they refinanced their house. Mm -hmm. So now we have ninety percent of people mortgages in the U.S. that are under six percent. Like 85% are under 5%, you know, like 35% or so are under 3%, something like that. And so now that rates are like 7%, none of, nobody wants to sell because they're all sitting on these 30-year fixed yeah. low rates, right? And so that's what's causing a real, real inventory crunch. Um, but that's interesting. So when the pandemic yeah. hit, yeah, yeah. When the pandemic hit there, did your government do stimulus to, did, he, did they issue stimulus checks to people to help them and stuff like we did? Yeah, absolutely. What what happened, uh, in my experience anyway, is there was a lot of stimulus government grants going out there, first home buyers and things like that. And the, um, the RBA, Reserve Bank of Australia, reduced the cash rate quite significantly. It went down to, I think it was 0.1% at its lowest. Which is okay. you know, next to nothing. We have a three percent buffer there, let's say. So yeah, it's in, we're really like. Um, so that obviously pushed a lot of demand into the market. And that's why we saw this huge boom. And and the RBA said, oh, we're not going to you know see rates rises again until that the earliest twenty twenty four. Now lots yeah rates started to rise in in uh, twenty two. You know May twenty two we saw a cash rate rise and we've had twelve consecutive rises since I believe, and now it's to uh, four point. I think it's 4.1 or 4.35. I think it's 4.1 mm -hmm. right now. Um, so that's gone up huge. Now they're saying that we've reached the peak and that we'll probably see the cash rate fall from here, ease back, not significantly. Mm -hmm. um, the big four banks in Australia are all predicting somewhere between the, the vicinity of 2.6 to 3.5% by the end of next year. Mm -hmm. or after. So if that interest rate starts to drop and this demand's there, that's just going to cause, you know, a new peak in prices. Yeah. That's what we're experiencing, man. And next year's an election year for us. So I just have the feeling, you know, I don't, I don't want to speculate too much, but I just have this feeling that they're going to do everything they can do to simulate the economy. Yeah. Um, but it's not going to take much. Like if they just reduce the rates a little bit, it's going to be like, you know, yeah. so. Next year's, yeah, election year. So that's the, that's the thought here. We have a uh, we have a like record year. We have we have a record amount of thirty three year olds this year. You know, it, it's been about almost twenty years since we've seen this many thirty three year olds in the U.S. And that's the that's the beginning average age of a first time home buyer. 
Mm -hmm. And 98%, according to a survey of these millennials, want to become homeowners. Yeah. And so you have this record amount, you know, unlike anything we've seen in our life, of 33-year-olds who want to become homeowners who are sitting on the sidelines because of mortgage rates right now that want to own homes, mm -hmm. right? Then you've got all the people that are sitting on low rates in their home that want to move, but they can. It doesn't make financial sense to move from a 4% mortgage to a 6% mortgage. So they just kind of feel handcuffed. And I believe that that is demand building of people who want to sell and upgrade to a new home. And every day that demand is building and building and building. Um, and so we have record amount of 33 year olds, tons of owners who want to upgrade their home that are just kind of sitting there brewing and just building and building and building right now. Mm -hmm. And the longer rates stay up, the bigger this, you know, this is going to get this bubble. I, I'm calling it a reverse housing bubble. You know, the, the bigger this bubble is going to, is going to be, and the louder it's going to pop, you know, when, when mortgage rates finally start coming down. So it's interesting you guys down there are kind of going through the same thing. Prices will come back, or do you think it's actually going to push prices up further over the next few years? No, I think it'll go up. Um, you know, I, it, in my opinion, no way that it can go down <laughs> under these circumstances. You know, um, the fundamentals of the real estate market are so solid right now here in the U.S., you know. The people who are sitting on mortgages have the ability to repay. The regulations on loans are so high. They're just, they make sure that these people can afford these loans. And um, the demand and, and is, is, so, is brewing so big and the supply is just nothing, right? And so when mortgage rates come down, that's going to release a little inventory as these owners do decide to upgrade, okay? But it's not going to be enough for the demand. So- yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do think we'll see prices increase. I don't, I don't think we'll have a negative year in terms of appreciation. We did last year wasn't negative. This year's not going to be. Next year's not going to be. So, and what what percentage of old homeowners actually have mortgages over there? Like, if you look at the Australian market here, and again, this is a, a rough estimate from from my knowledge, it's about thirty five percent, let's say, old homeowners that have mortgages. Most everybody owns a free and clear. So if you look at the rest of the market, it's probably a little bit higher than 35, but you look at the rest of the market, they have, they have wealth, you know, they have equity. Yeah. These yeah. People, you know, the, what's holding a lot of people back because I know a lot of people want to sell right now and it's not because of their interest rates. It's because, um, they can't find anywhere because there's a, there's a shortage of supply. So they'd right. love to sell, but they don't want to sell and then be homeless because that's the same thing I'm, here. I'm meeting people every week. You know, I've just sold my home. don't have anywhere to go. And now they're making some rough decisions and that's what's, you know, keeping prices high because they have no other options. They've got to pay that price. It's, it's the same thing here. Like the owners don't want to sell because of mortgage rates, but also because there's nothing to buy. Mm. There's two, there's two reasons why, you know, they don't really want to sell. Mm. Um, mm. But yeah, 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 it, it is. So that, that's cool, man, that, that you guys are, are kind of going through the same thing. I was wondering about that. Um, yeah, they always say a little bit behind you, like six months, 12 months, you know, on the U.S. Mm -hmm. And to answer your question, I think it's the opposite here, right? You guys are like 35 to 40% who have a mortgage. I think we're 35 to 40% who own or free and clear. I think the number is like 46% or something who don't have a mortgage. So I, I, I'm just, that's just off the top of my head. I may not be yeah. Yeah, well, that's correct right. on that. The Australian industry experts might have to correct me on that. So I think, um, I think it's interesting though that, you know, in a country where you guys don't have 30 year fixed mortgages, right? You've got a much larger percentage of people who own the properties free and clear. That makes, that makes sense because people don't want to get into a loan that the rate's going to change in three to five years or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. But over here, it makes sense for more people to have a mortgage because they're getting locked into a 30 year fixed rate, you know? But the equity in Australia's property too is is just significant. Like it's huge. Yeah. Uh, you know, so all these people have, have you know over the last couple of years made thirty percent. So if you bought before, then you're, you're probably pretty well off. You know, even if the interest rates go up. Yeah, they uh, in over here, depending on where you are, since the pandemic started, like everywhere is up, like anywhere from thirty to sixty percent. Prices are up thirty to sixty percent from. March of 2020, so, you know. Um, yeah, I get real nervous for the younger people, you know, trying to get into the market. But, uh, 
Now, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, now's a horrible time to buy. It's going to crash and burn and all this stuff. I'm out here buying houses every day. I just put a duplex under contract today uh, for three fifty. dollars It's a duplex I'm going to rent. I'm buying new construction homes. I've bought closed on two. I've got three more I'm buying and then the duplex. So that's six rental properties I'm buying right now mm. um, in this market over here. So I'm kind of putting my money where my mouth is. Let's switch over to the setup you guys have with buyer agents. Um, yeah. The lawsuit over here. So forever, and I don't know how much you you know realize how we operate over here, but the way that it works is is I go out, I get a listing. I'm the listing agent. The seller signs a listing agreement with me. And on the listing agreement, they agree to pay, let's just say, 6%. So I get the listing agreement for 6%. I go and I put it in my local MLS that gets syndicated to all the other agents. And I say, hey, if anybody brings a buyer, I'm going to give you 3%. Okay? So I split that 6%. I give them 3% and I keep 3%. Okay, and and on and on the HUD statement, the settlement statement, the closing statement, when we close, it shows the seller paying the six percent, with three percent going to the buyer agent and three percent going to the listing agent. Yeah, and that's kind of how we operate over here. Every single deal, the buyer agent commission is figured into the deal, right? Wow. It's baked. It's baked into the deal, and it really technically comes out of the commission that the seller agreed to pay the listing agent, yeah. right? And so this is how we've operated here for a hundred years. Okay. Yeah. And so then uh, here comes this lawsuit and the lawsuit says, Hey, you know, us as the set, it's, it's, it's property owners who sold the property suing, you know, you know, different real estate companies, right? Remax and blah, 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 blah. You know, national association of realtors, they're, they're suing all these people, all these companies and saying, Hey, we shouldn't have had to pay the buyer agent's commission, right? We we shouldn't have had to pay that. Um, and it's actually made it through court a couple of steps, and it's headed to like you know a court hearing. You know, like they they're allowing it and they're going to try this case, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of agents over here are are worried and really stirring it up that you know if this lawsuit goes through, that yeah, you know. Like, Owner, yeah. yeah, owners won't be able to pay the buyer agent out of the out of the you know the listing agent's commission like we have been, and then uh, uh, you know like there's there's a bunch of different camps, but one camp is out there saying commissions are going to go down to two or three percent for the listing side, and the buyer is going to have to figure out you know how to pay their agent if they're even going to have an agent, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people are worried about this. They think maybe buyer agents could potentially go away. They feel like the listing agent's going to be doing going to be doing twice as much work because now they're going to be representing the the seller and having to work with the buyer since there's no buyer agent and getting paid uh, twice you know half of what they were. Yeah, yeah. And um, so a lot of people are kind of in an uproar about this. So coming you know coming from you okay. who you live in this where there is no buyer agent commission figured into the listing side and everything. Um, I just wanted to understand more about how things are done there in Australia when it comes to this. Yeah, yeah. So, um, look, they're totally different, really. So, generally, it's seller agents. We go out there, we source, you know, property owners that want to sell, and we sell their properties. Um, we advertise it. Buyers come to us, and uh, the buyers buy the property. They don't pay a commission. The sellers pay the commission. Yeah. So, we work for our clients um, to get them top dollar, and mm -hmm. buyers know. They know that we're out there to try and get our clients the best deal. So that's, I guess, where it puts this, you know, um, this distrust against agents because buyers go up against us and go, geez, okay, well, they're going to want me to pay as much as I can. But that's how it works. Anywhere from 1% to 3%, in my knowledge, across most markets in Australia, mm. is what we expect for a commission from a seller. Right. If we get a bunch of buyers come along, that's up to us how closely we work with them. Now, a lot of agents are probably fairly slack um, with, without offense being met, but fairly slack with their their attitude towards buyers, you know, because buyers aren't paying them. So they don't, they sort of don't worry about them as much. But mm. you should be treating buyers with as much respect anyway because they, they could be a seller, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, but, you know, we work with the buyers. And so the good agents work with the buyers and say, okay, this one's not for you. And then we can use that buyer to try and source another lead. Hey, I've got a buyer. Are you considering selling? 
great. So I've had a lot of what we call off-market sales where we've got a buyer, we mm. introduce a property owner that's thinking of selling. They make them an offer that's you know just as good as what they wanted anyway, so they don't go to the market. Um, so that's typically how it works. Now, there are buyer's agents in Australia, um, and it's becoming more popular now. Um, so yeah, probably to the contrary of what you might've thought, but buyer's agents now in Australia are becoming more popular. And the reason is because people are busier. You usually have husband and wife both working, you know, long hours. Um, stock is harder to find. So there is a shortage of stock. And I guess buyers have a confidence that, Hey, if this buyer's agent knows the market, they know prices, perhaps they can negotiate me a better deal anyway. Yeah. So they can do all the legwork for the buyer. So they're becoming more popular. I just met with one yesterday, I had a great meetup and you know, we're going to work together. So if I've got some buyers um, that I can't spend as much time as he can spend with them, I'll introduce them to him. Now, if they decide to go to work with the buyer's agent, then they have to pay the buyer's agent commission. Mm. No, it's different. So if a buyer's agent comes to me with a buyer and they make an offer on a property that I've got for sale, that goes through. I still get paid my commission. The buyer agent gets paid by his client, which is the buyer. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And so the the buyer agent over there, they get paid at closing, or do they get an upfront fee, or how does it work? They, they get they get a part upfront fee. Okay. And paid at unconditional. At unconditional, I believe most cases where yeah. they get paid for So if that happened here, it would absolutely turn the industry upside down from what we're used to. You yeah. know, we're used to being able to take a buyer, represent them for their best interest, and then go and us as an agent, as a buyer agent, actually work um, with the listing agent, right? And negotiate the deal with the listing agent. We're working on the behalf of our buyer's best interest. They're working on the behalf of the seller's best interest. We're both trying to get the best deal for our client. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the buyer agent just gets paid out of closing whatever was negotiated basically in the beginning by the listing agent and what that, whatever's posted in MLS. So, yeah. Well, we do have an option. option. Like, you know, if there's another seller agent out there that's got a buyer, that sales agent could come to me and say, hey, Lee, I've got a buyer that may be interested in your property. Can we can we conjunct the commission? So then what we do, so let's say it's 2% commission, um, we can give up a percentage part of that commission. So we might say it's a 20% to the, the other agent. Okay. Of my, of my $10,000, I'll give you two grand because I introduce wire to the, the property or it might be half the commission. It depends. It's case by case, but um, I've heard, you know, 50, 50 splits done before in a slower market. So um, mm -hmm. that typically, you know, common, definitely in a slower market, in a, in a busier market, buyers are just out there anyway. So you don't really have to fight for them. But um, in a slower market, yeah, that's that's not uncommon too. Hmm. Yeah. Well, if we move over to that model, then it's going to be twice as much work for half the money. Because like now, we'll negotiate 6% and then we'll go out and find the buyer. Well, we get the 6%. Right? Yeah. The, the regular commission over here is anywhere, depending on where you are, like most places, you know, four is kind of on the low side. And then, you know, five uh, where i am like five and six is kind of the standard where yeah. i'm getting like five or six if i represent the buyer and the seller and i'm getting like two and a half or three if you know if i just kind of just <laughs> sleep on the couch and another agent comes along and brings the buyer yeah, I mean, conflict of interest there like there's always thought you know i'm representing my seller and i have a buyer and suddenly i'm getting paid by both it's the same. It's the same thing. Well, we're getting paid by the listing agent, though. Yeah, not, yeah. Right. So when we're so when we're doing both sides, we're actually working for the seller. Yeah. Right. Working for the seller's best best interest in that scenario. Um, yeah. Here in Alabama, we do have a limited consensual dual agency, which is kind of like kind of representing both sides to the fullest to make everybody happy, which is <laughs> never really, you know technically speaking that's just never really it's like you're always trying to get the better deal for somebody but um yeah dude if this lawsuit goes through a lot of things are going to change over here and uh but at the end of the day um it's not going to take us out it's just going to rearrange how we do things you know mm. um do you think it I, will change oh well i don't I, it's crazy because the thing is, is that, you know, how can the seller 
agree to pay a commission, right? Let's say they agree to pay 5%. They agree yeah. to pay it. Okay. The deal's yeah. done. The deal's closed. They got their money. They were happy. They paid what they said, but they were going to pay to the agent. And then they come back a couple of years later and say, wait a minute. I, you, you know, that you should, you know, I should. Yeah. Pay. Yeah. Well, it doesn't make sense. You weren't paying them. Like I paid that. That's kind of like subcontracting. You know, it's like yeah. you hire me to roof your house. I come measure your house or roof it. You know, I we agree on ten thousand dollars, and then yeah. I pay, and then I pay my crew. I pay another guy eight thousand dollars to actually do the work, and I make yeah. two thousand dollars for subcontracting the job to another crew. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, the same thing. No, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to cut it. I mean, I think if you've got, yeah, I mean, if you've agreed to the six percent, um, straight up, yeah, it doesn't matter how how you break. I can't it. believe it's made it this side of court. You mm. know. Yeah, well, I, I, just, I just I can't believe it. But if it happens, um, I think it'll wipe some some agents out who are spoiled with the current setup. Yeah, yeah. And because um, how do you do buy generation like buy leads? Is it just from advertising online like what we do? Yeah. So like we have Zillow a relationship. Like, People buy Zilla leads. People do. People do uh, YouTube. They do YouTube videos and stuff like yeah. that. I've I never did any of that. I dabbled. Literally did that kind of stuff for like a month here and there to test it out. But I always knew creating relationships with the property owners was you know the most efficient thing to do. Of course. Mm -hmm. So I always focused on that. So the agents who are focused on that are going to be just fine. They're going to have to rearrange the way that they do things if this were to happen the way that, you know, there's a, I think it's a chance for it to happen the way it's going to happen. But how would that change the commission? I mean, if you're listing a client's property, you're still going to be charging them 5%. I think so. Given up, in, given up. My, in my opinion, yeah. I mean, in my opinion, we're still going to be getting the same commissions that we're getting, but it could put some downward pressure because... It would be hard if, for both agents. Uh, mm. Yeah, if you... If you See what one thing that could happen is is, you know, if there's no more buyer agents and we're not paying a buyer agent fee, and these agents over here are used to getting two and a half to three percent when they sell something because another agent was involved, then they yeah. may be they may be fine and dandy to go out and list something for two and a half to three percent because that's what they were getting anyway, right? And so then if the agents right if the agents go out there and start reducing their commissions to compete with each other then that's what could bring the commission rates down. It's all negotiable. And that's part of the that's part of the issue. That's part of the, like the lawsuit is that they're acting like this an antitrust uh, you know, problem where, you know, we're fixing rates, you know, commission rates, but it's totally negotiable, right? Um a hundred percent negotiable. I negotiate on every single like there's nothing fixed about it. The only yeah. thing fixed about it is if agents, if they're, if no, you know, if the buyer agents aren't getting represent, represented and there's no buyer agent fees, then I fear that agents might come in and start undercutting each other, right? And start taking listings for two and a half to 3%, knowing they're getting all of that, no matter what mm -hmm. happens. And then yeah. they just kind of deal with doing, <laughs> dealing with do, working with the buyer. It's going to be a mess, bro, honestly. Cause yeah. it's like, it's like right now the setup is so good. Because buyers actually have representation. Yeah. Yeah. Their own representation. Mm -hmm. And if they do away with this, it's going to take the buyer representation out of the equation. And it's going to make it to where buyers aren't represented, which in my mind, in my opinion, is going to create more lawsuits. Yeah. All well, the buyers then, you know, pay a buyer's agent to go out there and do the work. For them. Yeah. But not, not all of them can. Right. No, not all the buyers. don't want it. A lot of them don't want it. Right. Not all. Well, we'll see how it all plays out. But I wanted to understand yeah, from your it'll perspective. Be be, what's up? It'll be interesting. Keep us posted. Yeah, I wanted to understand from your perspective, since you live in this kind of world. You know, that way, everybody that watches my channel can kind of get an idea of what the possibility could be if this lawsuit actually goes through. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we always um, appreciate the U.S. model. And how you guys operate? <laughs> That'd be nice. Would you rather be? Would you rather be here or there? I think it'd be nice, you know, to be there. But I, I still, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, I guess if the sellers agree to pay that commission, then 
and you find a buyer through another agent and you, you're splitting it. I mean, that's sort of what we do now in, in mm-hmm. a sense. With our yeah. conjunction fees. Yeah. Yeah. It's just not as practice, you know? Yeah. It's like I always say, you just, you just work the best deal you can and help everybody do what they want to do. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good philosophy. Cool, man. Well, uh, I know it's what, eight o'clock there now? Yeah, just after eight. Yep. <laughs> That's been you know, to get, get your day going and everything, man. I appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing a little bit with us about this, your business, how how it is down in Australia, all that good stuff. Um, I still got to come down there. Yeah, we'll get to down here soon. I need anyone who wants to connect in Australia or overseas, you can find me on Facebook. Just connect. Happy to chat. Yep. Yep. I'll put all of Lee's information down below if you guys are in Australia or if you just want to connect with Lee. I'll uh, I'll put all of his links below, his website, his social media handles and all that stuff. So you guys can reach out to him and say hello. And uh um, get Ricky here next year, twenty twenty four. Yeah. I'd love to I've been dying to come down there. So should do it. Yeah. No, it's cool, man. It's a plan. Thanks. Hey, appreciate you, Lee. Guys, we'll see you on the next video. And until then, keep crushing.